Thank you, guys. Cool. Um, so today we'll be talking about doing 3D graphics and specifically doing them without WebGL, that is, without your graphics card. Um, so a uh, quick preface, I'm going to be going quite fast because I don't have a lot of time and I have too many slides and too many things to say. So sorry about that, and I hope to make up for that in, in questions. Um, so ironically, uh, we have to kind of understand how things work in the WebGL world before we ditch in. And uh, the Elm WebGL API um, basically is summarized by these two functions. So we have WebGL to HTML, which is kind of boring. It takes a list of HTML attributes, a list of these things called entities, and it gives you a canvas element, which uh, basically has all the entities rendered to it. OK, that doesn't say much. So the actual thing must be in the entity thing, uh, which you get with this WebGL.entity function. Um, so it has these four arguments, uh, which have weird names. So we'll be kind of dissecting that and going one by one to, uh, through them in kind of an arbitrary order. Um, so the first thing I would like you to do is to ignore all the type variables for now. We'll cover, we'll cover them in a sec. Um, but we'll start with this thing called meshes. And the way I want you to think about them is to um, think of a bunch of triangles. And what I mean by that is when you do 3D stuff, the whole thing is basically a lie. And all you kind of do is render a bunch of 2D triangles in such a way that you trick people to think that they're seeing 3D stuff. And this is an example of a mesh. Um, well, four meshes of like uh, varying depth of, of resolution, which are the picture bunny. Um, so when I say triangle, I'm being kind of vague, but what I actually mean is that three vertices that describe a triangle. So right now you should be thinking a triangle is a triplet that is a three tuple with positions, and that's kind of it. Um, so in my three D thing. A mesh is a list of triangles, and those triangles are a triplet of attributes. And attributes, like they're kind of positions, but the thing is that if you don't restrict people to only put position information in there, you can do more stuff. So, you know, that's cool. Um, so, yeah, that's it for meshes, the bunch of triangles. Then we have this uh, first thing. Um, in the WebGL world, they call them shaders, and shader is kind of a um, general thing, it means a program that runs on your graphics card. Um, but that's kind of too general because programs can do many things. And in WebGL in particular, there's only two types of shaders. They're very specific programs. The first one is called a vertex shader. So shader, thing that runs on the GPU, vertex, thing that deals with vertices. And the vertex shader, the main thing it can do is you have some mesh, that is, you had the bunny in the previous slide, and the vertex shader lets you kind of transform that bunny, move, move it around. In this case, these images, we had this initial triangle, and we kind of rotated it uh, through the vertex shader. And that's kind of all you can do. It calculates the final position of your vertices. Um, but it can do a, another thing, which is it can kind of, um, how do I put it? It can add information to your vertices. So in this example, we started with a cube. The cube is basically our mesh, and you can think of like having vertices at where the lines connect. And the vertex shader did two things here. It moved the points a bit so that now it's more like a funky cube than an actual cube. And it added colors to each of the vertices. Um, OK, so that's kind of weird. Uh, just keep that in mind, and we'll see how we can actually Use that next. Um, okay, we're close. We have only two things remaining. Uh, the next thing is a pixel shader, which again is another program that runs on the GPU. Um, but this this thing, um, it's basically, its responsibility is, you know, in the in the last stage, we finish with like where our triangles are going to be in the screen. Now we actually have to put colors on the screen, and the engine is gonna get those triangles look at all the pixels that they should cover, and now you as the programmer, as the application writer, have to define which color those 
pixels are going to be. And you do that through a pixel shader. So you could, for example, say my pixel shader is going to be a function that basically always returns the color red. And so in this case, you would end up with a red triangle on your screen. Um, I think I have another. Um, yeah, this is an image depicting we, this is the result of the vertex shading stage. We have the three vertices. The engine is going to rasterize, that is, identify all the points that should, all the pixels that should be um, filled or painted in the screen. And through your pixel shader, you're going to say what, which colors do you want those pixels to be. Um, but now, if you think of, of this example, we said, OK, um, we're going to put colors on these particular vertices. But a rasterizer, the thing that's going to um, select the pixels that each triangle should be is going to, for example, for this triangle, fill all of those pixels. So you think, OK, what colors are going to you know, pass to that? And the idea is that the engine is going to basically interpolate the colors. So if you think along this line, where you have a red vertex and a yellow vertex, um, along this line, the colors should be like start a red and like fade to yellow, maybe passing through orange at some point. Um, and you can kind of visualize it on every pair of lines. And but in the middle, it's kind of complicated. Uh, so I have an image. <laughs> which is much clearer. And so the rasterizer is going to fill all the pixels and also interpolate all your data that you've associated to the, to the vertices. And in this case, this image is slightly mi misleading because it says only pixel shader here. But the thing is, the pixel shader is going to have access to the interpolated data. And then it can decide what color is going to put in each pixel. So for example, here, the pixel shader could discard the green component, and everything would look more reddish and bluish. Um, so we kind of covered everything. And finally, there's this thing called uniforms, which are very boring. They're just random user-defined data. And the way you can think of it is like, um, suppose you have like a, a bunny, and you want to rotate it on time. Um, the uniform could be your time. You can pass a different time value each second, and then your vertex shader is going to apply your rotation um, depending on the time. OK, um, so we kind of have everything now. And in WebGL, all of these things are a bit weird. Because um, if you see the WebGL documentation, there's special syntax for writing shaders and so on. And that kind of obscures all the process. So I decided to do a thing that can do that purely in Elm. Um, so here's introducing my terribly named Elm GL, um, which has a very similar API. Um, we have two main functions. Uh, render, which takes some width information for your quote unquote canvas. Uh, an entity, which basically mirrors the, the one in WebGL, and it gives you some HTML representation of the render thing. Um, and an entity, let's see, I gave things more meaningful names, in my opinion. Now it says actually vertex shader, pixel shader. We have a mesh, we have a uniform. Uh, we have these question marks, which are going to be uh, obvious in a sec. Um, so let's see what this looks like in Angel. So a vertex shader is just a function that takes your uniforms, that is your constant, basically your attributes, that is the things that describe your vertices. And its job is to define the final position of the vertices on the screen. So that's why it returns the position. And also may attach more data to vertices. That's why it returns this thing called bearings, which are the things you know that are going to be interpolated throughout the rendering thing. OK, um, we have that. Then we have pixel shader, which is going to be again just a simple function take some uniforms that is your constant takes the interpolated data um you know that you produce here and it has to return a color for that corresponding pixel and finally meshes and triangles are the same thing i, I showed before so um okay then what's this missing thing 
Well, this is kind of an annoying detail. Um, you know, in WebGL, uh, you have a compiler. It knows all the types of everything, and so it can do these interpolation kind of magically. But in Elm, you have to be a bit more concrete. So you ha this is basically a record of functions that you have to provide so that that interpolation can be actually done. You, you need to pass in addition, subtraction, and scaling function, and then everything works. But it, it, it doesn't really matter much. It's just an annoying, convenient, an annoying thing you have to do now. OK, uh, so how do we actually write our first triangle? Um, OK, we have to define what our uniforms are going to be, that is, our constants, uh, our attributes, which are the data, the, the basic data associated with vertices. I'm just going to use a vector of two components, that is, the x and y in our screen. And it varies. Um, I'm going to make it a constant color red, so I don't need any data in my pixel shader. OK, then I have to define my mesh. My uniforms, again, is an empty tuple. My vertex shader, my pixel shader, and that input thing that I showed before, uh, I provided a default implementation in this case. Um, so what is the mesh? OK, the mesh is a list of triangles. Triangles have three points. So we put a point at the bottom left a point at the top middle, and a point at the bottom right. That's going to define a triangle that's like flat on the bottom and like pointing up. Um, OK, our vertex shader takes the uniforms, takes the attributes we need, in which uh, in this case are just positions, and it has to you know, put the final position of the vertices on the screen. And we're basically doing a pass-through vertex shader that's usually the name it's used, which is just passing through the position data. Uh, it turns out this needs to be a vector of three components. It doesn't really matter much here, but I'm just like hard coding the Z component to be a one. And these deferring is the data that's going to be interpolated and passed to the pixel shader. We're going to do nothing there. And our pixel shader is going to be basically a constant function that always returns red. And after we do that, uh, we should get a red triangle on the screen. And because I have a bit of extra time, I'm going to squeeze in some extra, um, let me see if I can get these to work, some extra quick uh, light coding here. So suppose we want this triangle to move or something. We're going to check our examples solid triangle file, and we're going to modify our vertex shader. Right? So first of all, it's a bit too too big. It's covering the entire screen. Not sure if you can see it, because I made the background almost black and the canvas almost black. Uh, but I'm going to make it smaller. So uh, I'm using this um, matrix um, library. You don't have to know about this. You just have to read the names. I'm going to make it something that makes the, should be scale for it, that's scales my thing. So I want to scale the X component by 0.5, so having in the Y component the same, I'm going to keep the Z component equal, and I want to transform my positions by that. And that should work if it actually compiles. Uh, and this is actually called make scale. OK, now it's smaller. Now I also want to rotate it. Uh, ignore the syntax. You have to only read out the names. I'm going to make uh, rotate. This is a thing that rotates my thing. So I'm going to rotate it by, I don't know, some amount of degrees, whatever that means. On the Z axis, this is going to rotate it like clockwise. And my thing rotates. Okay, let's make it slightly more interesting. Let's take in the time and rotate it taking the time as the angle. So now this thing's going to fail to compile. I need to update my uniforms to take some float, which is going to represent time, um, and change my main file to pass in the time somewhere. Yeah, I think I call it model.t. Uh, and we have more type errors. What's the thing? Oh. Um, yeah, I had hard coded in my entity the uniforms to be an empty tuple. Now I want to take it 
as a parameter. Uh, it should be uniforms. And now we should compile and have a rotating triangle. <laughs> cool. Um, so you can do, thank you. <laughs> this is not very interesting. Um, but you can do a lot more than this. And um, so let me show you a quick example. Um, we had somewhere, let me see, this thing. Um, and I think I have kind of that example like coded here. Um, let me actually type correctly. And we have that cube, a rotating cube with magical colors. Um, okay, that's cool. Um, so let's see what else we can do. There's this side called Shader Toy where it works exactly as I said, but the thing is this, um, the way it's set up is they put two, uh, two triangles covering the entire screen. And the only thing you can use to put an image on the screen is a pixel shader. Um, and people like program interesting things and make cool images. So what I did is I wanted to see if I could do that. So I put a image that covers the entire screen and I basically grab literally this code and put it to Elm and wrote it as a pixel shader for my thing. And it's incredibly low resolution, but it does the same thing, uh, which is quite cool. Um, okay, we see we have, we can put weird colors of things. We have programmable pixel shaders. Uh, let's take another example from the official Elm WebGL thing, uh, which is, it's a very simple one, but it showcases a few things. So first of all, we have these, uh, we can move around. We have these box thing, and the box is it's just a cube, but uh, it's a texture cube. And that means they grabbed an image and basically painted that image on top of each face. So can we do that? Well, I tried, I literally copied that code. I replace the WebGL calls with mine and I have a texture cube. It's incredibly low resolution because it is, doesn't really run that fast, but it, it, you can jump and do the same things. So I think it's almost feature complete in terms of being able to do 3D stuff, um, but it's incredibly slow. And I believe that's all I have. Uh, for you today. Um, the code is hosted here, but it's uh, incredibly uh, hard to read code and it's some watch incomplete and there's some hacks to make all of this work. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's my talk. Thank you. First, having tried to do something vaguely similar, I must say it's not slow, it's incredibly fast. Like, Generating image in Pure Elm, I've tried it and I noped out of it after a couple hours. I just started using WebGL with the two triangle technique, actually. Uh, yeah. So my first question is, how do you generate the images? Like, how are you using? Well, I'm gonna show you, and this is probably gonna be the most embarrassing part. Um, I set out to do this, these stupidest way that it could work. And I start with the first idea, which is all of these things are divs. Every ah. single pixel is a div <laughs> with a background color. <laughs> that would work. <laughs> I'm it's, shocked that it's this fast. Cause like, and yeah, the, I like, I was gonna change it. Uh, so if you wanted to do something like this seriously and the, uh, what you should do is use a canvas and use the um, put uh, image data, which lets you like do a buffer in memory and just send it to the canvas. And I was gonna do something like that, something smarter, but it turns out that that's not the bottleneck here. Um, so I have a very similar example to this using Shader Toy as well. Uh, I think this is called Phantom something, um, which is another thing. And this one runs incredibly slow. And the bottleneck is actually the pixel shader code, which is kind of sad because it means that uh, you as the user of the library uh, are very constrained in what you can code. And the reason is that function, the pixel shader is gonna be called like once per pixel at least. And this is just 50 times 50, I think. So it's 2,500. 
So you don't really have a lot of time to do math and also that in a functional language is not, not the fastest thing in the world. Um, so yeah, um, the, the bottleneck for this, if you want to do something similar, you should be able to get it to work with the uh, anything kind of silly, but then you have to think about what kind of pictures you really want to put on the screen and you're kind of limited there. Makes sense, thank you. So is there any concept of a camera in this thing or is it just more simple? Um, um, sort of. Uh, so the, the, the thing is that in WebGL, there's no concept of a camera. There's no real concept of 3D stuff. And all of that is done by the programmer. So um, all the... If you ever see something rendered in 3D with WebGL or OpenGL, the, the logic for the camera is provided by the one who wrote the application. As you can see in these uh, WebGL examples, like you have a camera here, like this, someone moving, and that's application code. And that exact same code that they did here, I literally copy pasted in my app, and then you have kind of a camera. Um, so yeah, there's no concept of a camera, but there's no real concept of a camera in any 3D, uh, in any uh, graphics card API. I think WebGL or yeah, OpenGL version one had a concept of a camera, if I remember correctly. But that was way too high level, so they got rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know very little about any of these, so uh, yeah. You guys all probably know more than me on that. I must say, as an audio programmer, I'm a little bit jealous that that these shaders are so low level. I mean, in a lot of audio programming, you're always restricted in, in very high level stuff. And it's kind of hard to, to be so low level. But I think because of the efficiency in graphical programming, they have sort of, you always need to go very down to the, the, the actual calculation somehow. But uh, yeah. It's, it's funny in a way. I find it surprising. And, and you're right, Casper, that uh, it's, uh, it's a very low level, but it's not low level enough. So everything that everyone is using with WebGL and OpenGL is now getting replaced with uh, things like Vulkan and for the web, um, um, web GPU. So it's even lower uh, level so that you can control all the flow of the memory in the program and everything. So it gets more efficient. I, it's 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 passionating, but it's uh, you you go down a rabbit hole and uh, you never see the rabbit. <laughs> yeah, and like OpenGL, just rendering a triangle is only like a hundred lines, and your Vulkan is like fifteen hundred. In and it's I think one significant factor in the difference between like audio programming and this is that. Uh, so basically, a, a GPU is something that does that's relatively stupid but very parallel. And here, as an example, the pixel shader, of course, you can run it in parallel for all the pixels. So that's going to be very fast. Whereas if you're processing like live audio, you cannot like do this instant and the instant that we, the audio that will come in one minute because it's one minute from now, you can't do that. Yeah, and also with audio, I mean, the really interesting stuff like physical modeling of, of physical systems or something, you, you want to have the state kind of available everywhere and you want to things to be connected to, like, for instance, to simulate a violin or something interesting, like a saxophone or whatever. I mean, everything is connected together, so you want to have that state um, um, yeah, as, as globally available, which is something in graphics that they don't don't need for for a lot of things because you do it in parallel, I guess. But uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, one one thing related to that is uh, WebGL. Uh, like, there's many uh, graphics APIs ways to talk to your graphics card. Um, WebGL is a uh, restricted subset of OpenGL. And it only has these two shaders, uh, but there's many other types. Uh, for example, there's a geometry shader. Like they, they perform very simple functions, but there's another one called geometry shader, which lets you out of one triangle make hundreds. And so you can smooth out things uh, like in your modeling in your graphics art. 
so you do have high level constructs and and part of the reason like why Vulkan and all these other more modern APIs uh, happen is because OpenGL is way too high level in that regard. Oh, I think that's it. Thank you guys.